the moonwalk line was done. <laughs> yeah, that was a great, a great line. line. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I'm dying. <laughs> dying. <laughs> oh god. Oh my goodness. That was just so wow. perfectly vicious. Oh. But innocent too. Oh, this is great. Oh, from Orlando, Florida, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental, from the MLS Digital HQ, presented by Wells Fargo, a.k.a. the Ace Cafe. I am Andrew Weeby with my what, Charlie? My partners in soccer. Wow, you couldn't say that any cornier <laughs> if you tried. Charlie Davies, David Goss, Matt Doyle, doing it late night this now time. Charlie's an sounds. official citizen Does of Wichita sound that corny? after saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, hold on, time out. Time out. Charlie, we'll get to the MLS All-Star Game presented by Target. cool. Yeah, but Charlie's intentionally yeah. making it corny. He's like, he's laming it up. No, I mean, I'm this, just, this I'm, just it's a, I'm just mimicking exactly what you're saying. Oh, well. All right, fine. I didn't realize this was well, going to be a roast. No, no, no I thought that was seriously, I'll do clever. it better. Okay. <laughs> My partners in soccer. Well, that's dead and gone. That's over for me. I'll never say that ever again. No, you've Andrew, ruined it. You've it ruined it. So I'm so when you sensitive. Say it. You're, it's like, you're like my law firm. Uh, I consult with all of you. We are, of course, at the MLS Arsenal game presented by Target. In years past, this sort of show would have been done in a hotel room. Perhaps someone who's not here and whose name I won't mention lying on the floor, incapacitated. In this case, <laughs> we're just really tired. Because it's been a long, wonderful week here in Orlando. Festivities, I mean, EMLS events, concerts, skills challenge for the first time, the homegrown game presented by Energizer, and the game tonight. I mean, it just goes on and on. Turkish and on. food. Turkish food. It's, it's yes. literally events of the highest order. Yes. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that if I'm getting roasted here, at least Stu Holden is getting it as well. Yeah, of course. Because that line, <laughs> he's got to retire that he's line. Gotta, if I'm retiring he's partners in soccer, that line yeah, in the trash. he's just got to get rid of that one. We got some good interviews coming up for you. Walker Zimmerman of LAFC stopped by the Digital HQ earlier this week. So did Chris Wondolowski. He's going to talk LAFC culture with, uh, with Walker. And then Mateus Almeida, profe with Wando. He said he was a little bit nervous, didn't know how it was going to go. Obviously, it's going really well now. And then Graham Zussi stopped by, an Orlando uh, native son. He's going to talk about being a club lifer because he's been sporting Kansas City or Kansas City Wizards, depending on the era, TID for his entire career. So we'll get those in a little bit. We got a jam-packed mailbag. We promise we will get to that whole thing. We kind of skimped on it last time around here, and I felt bad about Shocking. that. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Dave does all the work to get the mail back together, and then it's Doyle's fault because he talks the entire time. It's true. Doyle I, I was barely on the long. show. It was Mark Anthony yeah. K. All it right. was a good interview. To be fair, Fantastic. I usually kind of tune out on the player interviews. Mark Anthony K was really good. Go back and listen to that one. Get to on know Monday. Doyle's early locked yeah, into the just show. Boom, boom. He's <laughs> Athletes are boring. Uh, well, <laughs> until they retire. <laughs> Then they're fun. Right, Charlie? I don't yeah. know. I, I might disagree with that one. <laughs> All right. The result here tonight in Orlando at Explorer Stadium, 3-0 at Letico Madrid. That's the fourth straight game. The uh, MLS All-Stars have lost to Euro competition. They're now 7-8, and eight, so below 500 since the format started Fire in 2005. Coach. Coach. Got to make a coaching change. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that, you know, that, that, that joke, pun, is, was pun yeah, that joke was a little <laughs> too <laughs> fitting given the season that Orlando's having right now. James O'Connor's got some work to do, but uh, tonight I don't think anybody will judge him harshly for. Marcus Llorente, who just got transferred from Real Madrid to Atletico, he scored the first goal, was the MVP. That that's because generally, as these things go, MVP voting is like in the 70th minute. And then in the 85th, Joe Felix, the 150 million or whatever it is, dollar man, knuckles one past Nick Ramondo, then he puts one on a dime for Diego Costa to put in the 90 plus three. So that's how you get the three nothing. Uh, what'd you guys make of the game? We won't spend too much time on this. It's an exhibition, it's an all-star game. It's really about fun. What'd you think? You were there, so how about you just take this? I think zero things about the game okay, on the sure. field. Uh, otherwise, it was really fun. How close, how many feet was the closest you were? To Diego Simeone? Correct. I was extremely close. Could you touch Diego him? Diego Simeone. <laughs> did well, you try to touch him? No. Emotionally? I would like to have it on the record <laughs> that I never did that. 
did just what? in case potentially I did. <laughs> I would like it on the record to be, but I never did. And there was a guy sitting next to me just chirping Diego Simeone in Spanish, and he turns to me and just goes, I saw him play at the new camp. I did the same thing to him 20 years ago. I was like, why would you do it again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the point of that? It's all come for you a know, circle. Play yeah. the hits. That's yeah, why. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Simeone just walking the sideline, getting his team compact, constantly getting his team compact. That was awesome. Uh, curveball was the Inter-Miami fans. Massive group of Inter Miami supporters outside partying, barbecuing. They came inside and basically filled up a whole gate. And I think security at Orlando City already hates them. So we're off to a good start. Beautiful. With that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what you need. Just like the Orlando fans clearly hate anybody who's an Atlanta yeah. player. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> that and that was, was the last one. That was awesome. Yeah. The <laughs> atmosphere is awesome. Like, it's, it's cool how much people in this city care about their team. You saw it at the skills challenge. Like, they didn't care about the stars from Atletico. They didn't care about Wayne Rooney. They wanted Orlando to win, and they cheered for them the whole time. And today, they booed Guzan right off the bat. They booed Guzan when he came off and Joseph came on. They were excited for Nani. Everyone was chanting for Nani around me. So, that was pretty cool. Do you Pete think, do you think that too. Orlando City would have won if Chris Mueller had been on the All-Star team? Because yeah, he was probably. the hero of the skills competition. Yeah, probably. Chris Mueller, cash, give it to him. <laughs> Absolutely. I saw that interview you guys did while I was gone. Yeah. He's got personality. Best got, interview we he's did. He's one of the rare athletes, Charlie, that has real <laughs> personality. Because he went like, to Wisconsin. You can really <laughs> feel it. Right? Everyone knows that. See, I could pick them out. I know which guys you can get gotcha. everything your, you want and that's more. That's your superpower? Yeah. You I see can him tell, on the field? Okay, yeah, he's got it. Yeah, he's got it. What was, uh, you know, anything about the game? Anything that really stands out? Yeah. Anything you want what to stand, dig into? What stands out to me is how good Atletico Madrid are. They're going to be a problem in La Liga for, mo for, for every team. Barcelona, Real Madrid already know after getting whooped 7-3 this preseason. Uh, Diego Costa is a man that's is on fire. He, he wants to succeed. You could tell he wants to hit the ground running in La Liga. The goal today, the, the four goals against Real Madrid, he wants to rediscover that form he had at Chelsea. And you see João Felix. I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo, the, the, the next Cristiano Ronaldo, well, he lives up to that bill already now. You could see that he's ready to take those expectations on. He wants to put that on his shoulder and own it. That's, imp that's so impressive for a 19-year-old to do that in that atmosphere. 20 goals last year in the Portuguese league now makes uh, just a massive, almost inconceivably large move. Uh, Money-wise, Atletico has had it's really hundreds of being him. around him. Really? Really? Well, what are you he gonna, seems so innocent. He was like taking a, pictures with Kaká on the field after for the sure, skills but challenge. Think about this. What's the most expensive thing you've ever been around in your entire life? That's a good point. Like, what if I, I, mean, I trip flown on an and fall on Jao Felix's ankle? It's a 133 million dollar ankle. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, it, yeah, but you would be celebrated in the other side of Madrid. Yeah, I don't want to be like, That's true. David you could be a hero. hero. I don't want to be You could, be a, you could maybe make a career <laughs> off that. Yeah. I don't want to be any honest part with of you. that. Were don't there you any, put that evil on any me. Any MLS All-Stars that you were like, oh, this was a – I saw something interesting from them, or even just like that was a nice moment. Uh, I mean, given, given the, the relationship between uh, Orlando City fans and Atlanta United players – I, I thought it was great uh, of P.T. Martinez to give away so many souvenirs. Anytime he got near goal, oh, he was no. oh, it would be straight into the crowd. Oh, he's throwing he's daggers. So and, you know, I'm pretty sure they were going toward the wall at that point, yeah. too. So he's giving it right to it the most hardest supporters. Love. There's a lot of love. Throwing daggers at an all-star I was always there for the first <laughs> half, and I was really impressed. And, yeah, when they booed Guzan in the warm-ups, yeah. I turned to the, the people next to me, and I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like, this is exactly what yeah. I was hoping for from these I fans. I saw some of the most cynical people that we know, like our, our good friends, like Pablo Mar, for example, yeah. being like, it is loud yeah. in here. And everyone's stuck. And after a yeah. rain delay. Everyone, yeah, that's after true. After an everyone, hour, well, I, 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 they were drinking beer in the concourse. For sure. So, <laughs> sure. like, you know, that increases the noise naturally. But behind the goals, bottom deck, everyone stood the entire, basically what Nani was on the field, the first yeah. 35, 45 minutes. Wayne hit a couple long balls to Nani, and I was right there watching him take guys 1v1. He megged someone, got fouled, but the referee didn't call it. Yeah, what's with that? It's an all-star game for everyone, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, it was fun. All right, that's it for most all-star as far as the game goes the week is what it's really about and I said this last year and I heard myself say it over and over and over again in the hallway leading to the ace cafe like if it's not on your calendar go and do it. but really you should 
Wherever Wait, it is next year, it's going to be a blast. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to just bring a little levity here because I'm still reeling from Charlie <laughs> taking something away from me that I held dear for a matter of like five months. My partners in soccer. Oh, okay, all right, no Jeez. more. <laughs> Golly, <laughs> oh, Willikers. All right. You guys have spent way too much time together. We're a little week. bit punchy. It's been a long week. Intense, punchy. Yeah. What was your favorite moment from the week? Take the game away. Just a week overall. What was your favorite moment? I was unprepared for that question. Yeah, you were. So I'll take it. Surprising. It was obviously Howard Webb and Zlatan <laughs> having, a, having a little chat. Was it on Tuesday at All-Star Training? Yeah, it was up and in the Zlatan concourse. And Zlatan gesticulating and Howard Webb trying to explain God knows what to him. Probably something about elbows and the side mm. of heads and whatnot. Yeah. But that's just like one of those moments that as an MLS nerd, as a MLS now referee nerd, I look at that and I'm just like, I just, I want to know everything these guys are saying to each other and it would happen nowhere else but the All-Star game because this is where everybody just kind of gets dumped into a city, mixed together and all these weird, bizarre meetings and conversations and happenstance happen and to have just days after the controversy, Howard Webb and Zlatan face to face working it out or whatever they were doing, that was just a brilliant moment. Uh, I'll give you a little cherry on top. He walked down and then walked up to Bastian Schweinsteiger and said, hey man, for a 70 year old, you look pretty good. <laughs> it was a shot from Zlatan just, uh, fast. Just, he was <laughs> out there just pinging guys. Both those guys at Man U together. Yeah. What do you, th what do you think? For me, it's EMLS. The EMLS event here, Bion West, the director of EMLS, continues to put on these unbelievable events. EMLS Cup was a hit. And you come here, the place is packed. You had uh, Alvaro Morata and Vitolo down here playing games against some of our EMLSers. And the vibe was good, the food was good, and you just had that, this is the, this is the place you want to be. That's what I ex uh, expect now going to an EMLS event, to be entertained and for everyone to get along. The nice thing is about events like that, and just the whole thing, you can actually see the Atletico Madrid players they really enjoyed it, yeah. which sometimes you think like these guys come in, they're in preseason, they're being asked to do a lot as far as media is concerned and like promotion. Mm -hmm. They might be a little cynical and just be like, meh, not about meh, trying to go to dinner, trying to go to the hotel and just like sit on my phone. No, every time I saw Atletico Madrid players, they were smiling, they were into it. They're like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. Anybody going Nani? Anybody going Skills Challenge? Because that's the thing I think ultimately everybody will yeah, remember. I, I think, I mean, that was going to be my answer, but the reality is my favorite part now is when Charlie roasted you at the start of the show. <laughs> That's true. Can, we, can we replay that? Can we <laughs> maybe just close the show with Anders, that? Anders, our well? producer, producer Anders, has actually been in my ear this entire yeah. time laughing, telling me we're absolutely <laughs> clipping that. It's the first thing I'm pulling out to distribute to the masses. Uh, I will remember that moment forever, <laughs> but like the Nani thing was so cool because I. I'm a, I'm a pretty skeptical guy. You may have noticed, and I like the skills challenge. I wasn't feeling it, and within like five minutes, you could tell that the players out there, like, okay, it wasn't just about putting on a show. Like it was competition. Like as soon as they got the fire in their eyes, then I started feeling it too, and I think the crowd started feeling it, and then gets down to the end, and like the the last the last skill was essentially crossbar challenge, and Nani pinging it from midfield as time expires for the win. That was dope. It you was. couldn't script that better. Absolutely not. That and better. I, I, I want to see what is next year because this was the first go round. It's where you work out some of the kinks and to get that result is just like it's magic the first time. But they can make it better. They can find ways to kind of hone the events, the process, the broadcast, everything else. And I, I have to add a team. Yeah. Legends. 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 Oh, we get Guatemala in here. Yeah. I know he's got duties as a mayor. Give me Valderrama. Pinging yes. balls at targets. I think you need like a legend from the first David era. Beckham. You need the mid era. Yeah, and then, yeah. Oh, and Inter Miami comes in. It's perfect. Yep. Money. Bring David in. All right, next year. All right. Done. There it is. Let us know All if right. you want MLS legend. Oh, wait, 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 get it do done. Owners, too, because you get David in and you can get Mia Hamm and then there, and James Harden. There's the owner's oh, group. Wow. Oh, wow. Steve Nash. Now we're, Steve Nash. Na oh, wow. Well. Now we're rolling here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, guys, the you know, right, you can pay us later. Creates. You can pay us, send the consulting fees later. to us. You can make that out to Andrew Weeby, and, and I will distribute it to my soccer. partners in soccer. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Uh, look, it's been a great week. We had a lot of fun here. Uh, but MLS doesn't stop. Uh, we'll get to the big games of the weekend here in just a second. You got a big one on Fox on Saturday at 5 p.m. Atlanta 
LA Galaxy, New England LAFC, and then on Sunday you have a triple header on national TV, ESPN and FS1. We'll get to those in just a second. We do have some mail from the All-Star Game. I'm going to get to that before we get to the rest of it. Luke from Waterloo, Iowa says, I'm sitting here watching the All-Star Game as Pomichol and Barco are about to get subbed in together. So the question is, Pomichol or Barco? Who's better right now? Who will be at a better club, a better situation in five years? Who will be the first to get a senior level national team cap? That last one he says is for you, Doyle. I want to focus on the first two. Who's better now? I'm guessing maybe people are going to say Pomichol. I don't know. Maybe we're biased in yeah, here. Yeah, it's Pomichol. What did yeah, you I'm say? Gonna... Barco or Pomichol? Barco. Okay, so we have a split there. That's okay. I want to know who's going to be at a better club, better situation in five years. Make your predictions. I think Pomichol is just a better player all around. He's a much better defensive player. Like He's an elite nearly Tyler Adams level defensive player but then he combines that with the ability to be a high level distributor going forward and combines well around the box I like look man there's already big clubs after Paxton Pomichol now he might not go for as big a number as Barco goes for because having an Argentinian pedigree matters in the world transfer market and that, that's just the way it is because we haven't developed a ton of high level players but I think what Pomichol's done, his ability to conduct a game, to influence it on both sides, I don't see a ton of weaknesses with him. For Barco, as gifted as he is, and he's really gifted on the ball, he does that Nagby thing where he will eliminate defenders off the dribble, and then rather than make the killer pass, he slows down, he lets them back into the play, and he plays sideways. He ne if he's going to be an attacking midfielder, he needs to make better progressive passes. If he's going to be a winger, he needs to stretch the field vertically. He doesn't do either of those things. So I worry about where he would fit at a big club. I think he's changed a lot in a lot of ways when you look at this season compared to last. This season, once, once actually he came in as a, as a substitute in the first half against the New England Re Revolution on the road, banged two goals, he took off. Unfortunately, injuries have derailed that, that progress that he's shown throughout the season. Hit the U-20 World Cup with that banger uh, volley. He's, he's playing with confidence. I feel like this DeBora system fits him better than, than what it did with Tata Martino. So he's thrive. He's, he's one of the players that I look at is thriving with DeBoer as coach. And he, he needs to be on the field, needs to be healthy. And I think once he does get his fitness back, this Atlanta side may start make, making those strides. I'm going to split this one and say Barco's at a better club and Pomichol's in a better situation in five years. I think Pomichol will be a starter for a good team in one of the top three or four leagues. And I think Barco will be sitting on the bench at one of the top teams in the world. All right, CM hit us up and says the skills competition was simply awesome. I'm thinking even more so that the All-Star game is some unique to MLS that people around the world would love to see. Stu Holden was saying on the broadcast, he heard from his friends in England and around uh, from different spots uh, overseas saying, whoa. That's interesting. That's different. That's fun. We would love to do that as well. CMS, is there any other soccer league in the world that does something similar? I haven't seen, honestly, anybody do anything like this other than, like, you know, YouTube content creators and, like, Instagram people. We've done it a couple times here to a lesser extent with, like, the EA Sports Challenge. It wasn't streamed. It wasn't quite as big. He says it would be sweet. CM says if there was a skill competition before the final. MLS Cup. That's not going to happen. No. But, no. but that is, this is not going anywhere anytime soon. So I hope you enjoyed that. It'll be back next year. Uh, let's just get into the games this week and let's start with Atlanta, LA. Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern on Fox. Atlanta, don't seem that happy if you believe the All-Stars <laughs> here. Don't seem like they're enjoying life all that much. And maybe that's just in comparison to what it was like under Tata Martino. This is a big opportunity for them. Doyle, you've repeated over and over and over the stat. What is it? Last 12 games. 5, 6, and 1. It's not, five, a, six, and one not the, a great the mark. They had that five-game run of shutout wins, and since then they've been a below 500 team, and they don't look happy, like as we've been saying. And they're, they're super talented, so they can get results just based off that. Um, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just be talented. And we've seen that repeatedly in MLS, especially in the TAM era, as talent, there's a talent differential has kind of spread out. Um, it's not enough. And they don't have an identity now. And it feels like they're no closer to having one, maybe even further from having one, than they were in March. Uh, and in, look, they're still going to make the playoffs. I'd be shocked if they don't make the playoffs. But we're talking about maybe not getting a home game here. That's significant. Um, harder to win on the road, plus just what it means to that city to be 
that city that has that team and you know that come playoff time you're going to get 30 of your closest friends and 50,000 other of your closest friends and put them into that stadium it's tough they got to start winning they got to start showing that they know what they're doing last four games they lost to Seattle they beat Houston whooped up on them at home beat DC at home and then they lost at LA they're back at home I think there's a good matchup for them when you won without slots on obviously for the Galaxy he's suspended for this one so there's less threat up top and I think when you look at the Galaxy back line specifically Polenta playing at left back who's just not a natural left back I think what they've done over the last few games what they did at least at home against DC which I think you'll see again is that five-man back line let Gressel fly forward pull Polenta a little wide and then Escobar plays as the right center back or whoever it is and then they bomb in over the last 40 45 minutes and that creates openings and gaps for guys like Nagby or Barco or PT whoever's there to find openings I think the Galaxy backline is one that you can get disorganized and you can get it, it chaotic and without slots on up top you just don't have that giant threat and I think this is a good game for them to not show what they're doing but get wins and that's yeah. what they need to do at they this point to. to make everyone happy it doesn't have to be pretty yet it needs to be like, I like where I'm at, and we're all happy to be here before you can get to the because next Because there is massive pressure on this game, I believe. Not just because it's on national TV. I'm not sure that the coaches and the players are all thinking, okay, we have to win because of that. But because you had this week and the players saying, we don't really like this. This isn't really working that well for us. The past was better than the present in our minds. Now Frank DeBoer has to find a way to get him to go out there against a team that doesn't have Zlatan at home with the big crowd. They, they should win this game. If they are going to be the team they think they are, they will win this game, and that's where pressure comes from. Narratives, media, talk, emotions in the locker room, and the expectation that they get three points. New England at home against LFC, Charlie, though, feel like they're just kind of, they're going to play without any pressure because they got the Supporters' Shield leaders in town at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday on ESPN+. They're 11 games unbeaten. If they lose this one, it's just a blip, and it's to the best team. It's a huge opportunity for Bruce Arena to put one over Bob Bradley, by the way, but also to show his the team. The first ever babysitter of his kids. Wait, That's who? What, he what? Said this week? <laughs> wow. No. Who? Wait. Who said that about Bob? Oh, I thought I was like yeah. Charlie? No, Charlie. I was like Bruce Arena <laughs> yeah. was Charlie, watching Charlie's kids. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm Benjamin Button, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think that when you look at this match, it's not, it's not a six-pointer. It doesn't mean that much to LAFC. However, it means the world to New England because if you do win, now you have that inner belief that we can play with the best. And I don't think they quite think that they can compete with the LAFCs and the Portlands and the Seattles. But if you win this game, all of a sudden, that belief really is sparked inside that we can make a run, we can play with the best, and that we are a great team. We have a great team. We're tested now. And it's, that'll be 12 games unbeaten. So this is one of those matches where you look at a Carlos Heel and what he can do for, for New England Revolution. Carving, uh, carving out space for players like Teal Bunbury, who's made uh, you know, great runs in behind. He's been finishing his chances. Uh, uh, Christian Pania has really excelled under Bruce Arena. Bruce has, has been able to push guys and get them to play better. Christian Pania has been very inconsistent. He's one of those guys that has been a spark off the bench. Then when he started, he, he's, he's been good, but then he's, he's got lost his, his pace, hasn't been as aggressive. Now he's getting them to be gr aggressive for 90 minutes to push the envelope. They're winning games by three, four goals. That was unheard of before. Now they know, okay, we can score goals and we can also shut out. Matt Turner has the best goals against average over the past month and a half. That's, that's remarkable that he's been able to turn this whole thing around from the back and up top. And so when you look at this midfield battle, Carlos Hill, uh, Atuesta, and Mark Anthony K. what's going to be done there? Are they going to sit back and look to counter, counter press? Is, is New England going to sit back and just and make it compact, make it tough for LAFC and frustrate Carlos Vela? Because everything is going to be on, on Carlos Vela. All the attention is going to be on Carlos Vela. Can Rossi have a big game? That's when they're going to need Diego Rossi to really step up and score goals. I love this matchup for a few reasons. One, we always get asked, and I've had it a few times this week, is so-and-so for real? You know, are the Revs for real? Right. Whatever team. LAFC at Seattle at Red Bulls. That's the next three games. They're going to find out themselves, and we're all going to find out. They're going to prove a lot, or we're going to figure out that maybe they're a sixth or seventh place team, which is also still a huge improvement in the Eastern Conference. One of the things I question with the Revs is when they're not going downhill, when they're not the attacking team, how can they do? Because they play 
pretty much two or three fullbacks that are wingers. And so when you talk about Vela and Rossi, this is a chance to see those guys under pressure. How does Brandon Bai defend right. 1v1? How does, is it, whether it's Jones or Castillo, how do they defend? And then is there enough help at center back to, do, to help them out to survive these matchups? We saw the Galaxy do it against Vela with Polenta, which I was shocked to see, but they were able to do it. And Jonah was a big part of that, helping from the middle. So I think this is a fascinating matchup. And these ne this next three weeks for the Revs is going to be huge for what 2019 is. That's the Revs side for the LAFC side. Let's go to Walker Zimmerman. He stopped by the MLS Digital HQ, presented by Wells Fargo on Monday. Let's take a listen to that interview now. All right, let's keep the All-Stars rolling through here. Walker Zimmerman joining us in the MLS uh, Digital HQ, presented by Wells Fargo. Walker, to start you off, which Barca player are you? Mark Anthony K says he's like a mix of Busquets and maybe Xavi or Iniesta. So when you watch film, are you PK? I are mean, you... I guess I have to be, right? You don't get it. Bob has not made a comparison. Uh, no, I think we, we have watched some clips of PK, um, watched some of the, the movements that he does, his footwork. We focus on that for 1v1 defending, so... Um, I, I would say PK, yeah. Were you a Barca fan before? Yeah, I was. Um, it's, it's always fun to watch them, especially back when, when they were kind of on that run where they were just unbelievable. Um, so got to watch them a lot. Um, now you watch now them, we watch them <laughs> quite often uh, in film. We watch them, Man City, Liverpool. Those would be the big three teams that we probably watch and all the time. Your, who's your favorite center back to watch? Um... I like watching Sergio Ramos too, to be honest. I really, uh -oh. especially especially watching his uh, set pieces. I like I like watching his movement on set pieces. I think he has a knack for finding the ball, and it's cool to see like the way he changes it up. Um, but I certainly don't go into as many reckless challenges as him, uh, or drift maybe as much as he does. But I think it's it's always interesting when you watch him play. So take us into your mind on a, a set piece. It's a corner kick. Where are you trying to set up? I what? can't give you all of the. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Maybe generalities. Like what yeah. are you what are you looking for on a set piece? Uh, first thing is zone or man marking. So if it's man marking, you look at okay, can I get a pick somewhere from a teammate? Um, is he what side of your hip is he on? Is he on your left or your right? Um, and then if it's a zone, you look at the space. Where's the space that you can maybe attack? And then you just got to kind of commit to that run and that space and hope the ball finds you. Um, so a lot of different things. It's great having guys like uh, in my career, like Carlos, who serves a good ball. Mauro Diaz, when he was in Dallas, served a great ball. So a lot of it's putting trust in those guys to kind of put in a good spot. And then hopefully you can find some success with it. So hoping we can get a few more here in 2019. Is, is there anyone in MLS where you don't look at them, try and mark you and be like, I'm about to dunk on this guy? Um, like, who do you fear in the air? You probably don't fear anybody. Yeah. But who do you no. think is maybe your who's going to give you who's going to no, give you me and, I, me and I had a funny go. little go back and forth. Um, on the Benny and Sal podcast. Oh, Shout out to you guys. Good plug. Okay. Well um, done. Yeah. yeah, so one of Ike's questions was about, you know, who's who's better in the air. And so I know that we would both say ourselves, um, <laughs> which is totally fine. But um, I, I definitely love his, his aerial game for sure. Um, he's obviously been one of the best aerial, aerial players past 10 years. So he's a big time guy. What do you think about the fact that Ike is maybe the best part of the Benny and Sal podcast? But Ike is not a part of the name, yeah. nor is he visually <laughs> represented in any way on that podcast. I don't know why he signed up for that, other than I, I know Benny can be pretty persuasive sometimes. <laughs> but, I mean, Ike's got to get his name in there somehow. Ike's getting slam dunked he on is. his own podcast. Right. Yeah, but can is. I throw this out there? Because Graham mentioned it as he walked off. If you add his name into the acronym. If it went first, it would be IBS. I did think about that. I told Ike not that smooth. as well. Not right? smooth. <laughs> SBI, so you're not, shout you're not out Yeah, yeah. <laughs> SBI, we get a little throwback, but they're yeah. gonna share the, yeah. you know, the Google algorithm there. The SEO is not great for you. <laughs> I can understand why they pushed him off. Yeah. <laughs> Take us inside your decision to re-sign with LAFC. Well, I mean, I think I had a very good experience there year one. Um, saw a lot of positive things with the way the club was going, um, the, the personnel that we have, the, the coaching staff. I felt like I was still developing as a player, and that's something that was really important to me was uh, am I in an environment where I can get better every day? And I think the staff, with, with their help, uh, the way we train, the way we play, I think it helps me as a defender. So it was, um, it was a great decision, I think, looking back. Where have you improved the most since being with LAFC? I, I would say just on the ball, uh, just being comfortable, um, expanding the, the passing game for sure. So it's, it's nice to be in, in trainings where you're oftentimes asked to be a part of the, the exercise, whereas sometimes, you know, 
in Dallas, and it's different. Everything's different, so don't get me wrong. It, it was, I learned a lot in Dallas as well, but it was a lot more functional. So like defending, defending the box, um, you know, defending crosses from out wide, um, and obviously we we dropped a little bit more as a team. So now it's a little bit more in isolation, having to work on one v one defending, uh, have the ball a lot more, um, able to kind of uh, start the attack a little bit more, whereas. It was probably a little bit more defensive in Dallas. What was it like going from playing with a veteran like Simon in your first year to being the veteran alongside Segura this year? Well, I think, you know, I feel comfortable around around anyone who I'm playing next to. Um, to be honest, um, had had some good fortune playing against some quality center backs my whole career, starting back with George John. Um, you know, Matt Hedges. We had a good partnership in Dallas for a few years. Um, Laurent was obviously a very talented player. I think you look at him and his ability on the ball, I think with him leaving, it kind of shifted more of that responsibility to me, and I, I really enjoyed that. So um, it's been fun. Eddie's done a tremendous job, I think. Um, really happy just actually we announced that he resigned. So yep. um, really happy to have him as, as the partner as well. One more. we got to get you out of here. Chris Wondolowski is waiting by here. LAFC presumptive favorites for the Supporters Shield. You guys got a big lead there. Same thing goes for MLS Cup, MVP for Vela. What's it like to be on the inside of a team that's making history? It's a lot more fun, for sure. Um, when you're winning, the, the vibes are good in the locker room. Everyone has a good attitude. Everyone's getting recognition, like you mentioned. Um, so, so guys are happy about that. Um, I think ultimately we know that we're, we're far from securing anything, and so we have the mentality to keep going, win a supporter shield, and, and clinch that number one seed, which will help us in our run to the MLS uh, Cup. We're not ending with that. Yeah, I This weekend, <laughs> yes, thank you. you're taking on New England Revolution. Yeah. 11 games unbeaten. Right. Wait, don't so go there. They're, they're the hottest team in MLS. You're the best team in MLS when it comes to points. What do you, what do you need to do to ensure that you get three points? against the New England Revolution. Yeah, they, they've certainly been incredible to watch uh, this past, past little stretch. Obviously, since Bruce took over, you just feel a different energy about the team. Uh, they're dynamic in the way that they're going forward. Um, heel has been incredible. Uh, Bunbury's finding form. Agadello playing a little different position. So these are all players that uh, have always been really talented, and now they're kind of um, coming into to form. And so <clears throat> for us as a team, we got to focus on what we do well, counter press, uh, stay high, be aggressive, create chances going directly to goal. And then uh, looking forward to that's going to be a really good game again. Um, so now we've got a good, good stretch where we played you know, Galaxy, uh, Atlanta, New England. It's a good stretch for us to, to really find out what we're made of. Cameras are off now. How much has Bob talked about Bruce? These are the two, two of the godfathers of U.S. I mean, they obviously had that relationship going way back mm -hmm. you know, to Virginia. Um, but honestly, not not too much. Um, I know he's keeping it internal. That, yeah, yeah, it's internal. Yeah, I he's think fired so. Up for this I one. think so. I think it's kind of a personal war. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think he feels that way about like any of other coaches. That's like <laughs> getting some height. So like anyone who takes over the national team ever, he's like, ah, oh, well, back in my head, you know, like, yeah. well, the way I do it is differently. So I I think he always has that kind of edge to him. Um, and I'm sure it's watching Bruce's success, he's like, oh, I gotta crush him. So. A lot of people have good Bruce uh, impressions. You got to work on your Bob impression. Uh, yeah. Well, look, uh, the, the way that we play is sharper, more fluid. Uh, these are the football ideas that we work on every day. <laughs> that was actually yes, spot that was, on. Yes, yes I did not intend for that to come out, but thank you to Walker Zoom for sharing <laughs> that impression with us and a little insight into LAFC. Thanks, Walker. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Big thanks to Walker Zimmerman for stopping by. We will get to Chris Wondolowski in just one second. But before, the Toronto Duck has a little mail for us. Who has the more unexpected season, New England or San Jose? Which one is the Ooh. most shocking? San Jose, uh, when you look at it from the start. But I think over the course of these 11 games, it's got to be New England. I think it's got to be San Jose. This is a team that lost their first four games. They didn't make any changes. They were hot garbage last well, that's year. That's not true. Horrible. Any. Horrible. They didn't make many, but they didn't. Make they made okay. They made nine. some. They made some, but they weren't moves that were like, boom. This no, is going to explode. This is going to change your team. team. No Christian, earth shattering moves. Yes. Yes. Christian Espinosa. Yeah, he, he should improve them. Marcos Lopez. But they were so bad before that you're like, well, maybe that might get them into like playoff line zone. Right now they're at 37 points. They're tied with the Galaxy. They're rising. Nobody wants to play this team. They completely believe in themselves. To me, Vaco. it has to be San Jose. Looks like an MVP yeah, candidate. Yeah, Vaco looks like an MVP candidate. Now maybe yeah. we should have seen this coming because of what Mateus Almeida has done in the past. 
Couldn't have seen this. <laughs> Couldn't have seen, I mean, like, he, he's been an amazing coach, obviously, in Argentina and then with Chivas. But, like, especially after those first four games, Wando looked washed. Wando's out of the lineup. Yeah. Making huge changes at the end of March. And, like, just try to stay afloat and maybe get 25, 30 points this year. And he made two big changes. He put Florian Youngworth back in the center of defense. And he put Jackson Ewell in central midfield. And those two guys are arguably the two best passers in the league at their respective spots. And their ability to distribute has suddenly spread the game out. When they spread, the, spread you out attacking-wise, they're able to envelop you. And they're able to do that and then create chances by playing those diagonals to those, to those wingers. And it's been Vaco. You're right. It's been Espinosa. You're right. It's been Shea Salinas. Shea Salinas had six goals and three assists this year. His previous high, career high, for goals was three. And he got all that to happen. But then he also kept the locker room. Because taking Wando out of the lineup was a huge risk. When you have a guy like that who has meant so much to that team, benching him, it, it took, we know the word, and, and Almeida has him. And he got <laughs> Wando to stay bought in the whole time. And not just Wando, but those other veterans as well. So that when he needed them a month later, they were there. And yeah. that's how, I mean, they, they're 1 through 25 now, man. They have a huge roster that everybody has contributed, and nobody could have seen this coming. Let's get Wando's perspective on Mateus Almeida right now. We spoke to him on Monday right here at the Digital HQ. Chris Wondolowski sitting down with us now. Chris, profe, I will run through that brick wall directly in front of us. From Mateus Almeida, will you join me? I'm uh, join with you, no right doubt. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm all in with Mateus. He's, a, he's an amazing man. So take us behind the scenes. Just what, what was it like <laughs> when he was hired, and then we'll go from there because that's a huge name and it's a completely different sort of profile. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, I, I has a great resume. Uh, you know, obviously he's won championships. Uh, you know, I was very interested to see how the dynamic was going to work with him, uh, you know, speaking Spanish only. And uh, no, but it's been great. Uh, from the first day, he sat us down. And from day one, uh, I've been all in. Uh, he's uh, very charismatic and a guy that you want to play for. Is, and he, is he hands on, on the field, or in training? Like tactically uh, yeah absolutely he, he has a great staff but he's very hands-on uh, especially during when we're playing when we're playing he's uh he's all all about it showing us where we need to move the ball where we need to be um again yeah, he has a great staff he has a strength and conditioning coach Guido and he's one of those he's a hard he's a hard guy and uh but at the same time he's one of those guys where you want him to respect you so you do whatever it takes it's a uh, it's an amazing balance and it's uh it's funny to see so when you see him come in do you have the? Pr did you feel the pressure to impress because you're starting from scratch and you're the you're the goal scoring king in MLS, but you you got a new coach and he doesn't know you that well. So did you feel that pressure? Yeah, absolutely. I actually felt it more than I ever had. Uh, you know, coming off a year where we're dead last and uh, you know I'm getting older and knew his style, knew his you have to be very fit, you have to work hard. Uh, you have no idea if he's going to like you or wants to bring in other uh, you know other guys and so it was one of those where you kind of had to prove yourself again and uh, I like that challenge but at the same time you never know what's uh, what's going to happen. You said fitness and I think that's the word that I think of when I watch you guys play right now. I mean it's a beautiful style mm -hmm. and it's like aesthetically pleasing but I'm like how are they running this much? Yeah. Guido is the perfect name for a strength coach right. but I heard he you exactly. had two a days in Mexico to oh, start the year. Yeah, we had two a days, uh, sometimes even three, with a gym session there. It was uh, it was unreal. It was it was beautiful Cancun, and uh, didn't get to see the beach. <laughs> or when we were at the beach, it was a beach runs, uh, you know, in the deep sand. And uh, but at the same time, it's it's paying off, and it's one of those where we're finally now able to see the results. And he preached this earlier. He told us that when you guys do become one of the fittest teams, 75th minute, you're going to wear teams down. It'll end up 3 4 nothing. It'll A team will get a red card because they'll hate just having you next to them the whole time. And um, it's working. And it's pretty cool to see you know, it all come in, come, coming out to fruition. You've played this game for a while. He comes in and has a different idea of the way the game's played, different style. Yeah. At some point, was it like, this makes no sense or this is super weird? 
Um, yeah, it was definitely different just because you've had so many, I guess, core values. You know, you, you have your two banks of four, and, you know, you got to stay in the straight line and make sure you, you all push up at the same time. And he comes in, he's like, no, no <laughs> lines. You go and you step here, and you don't let this guy turn. He's like, the right right back's thinking, the left winger's in there, though. Like, where, where do I go? Do I say? He's like, no, you go in there. And it's, it was one of those where it's kind of groundbreaking. Being a forward, I love it because it actually requires less running for me. So <laughs> it's actually a decent thing. But uh, he's amazing, which knowing who to press, they, they're, the whole staff does their homework and does a great job of coming up with characteristics on each player and the, how accurate they are with how new they are to the league. It's, it's amazing. For those of the people out there that maybe don't have a good idea or haven't watched San Jose play much this year, describe for them and for us your style of play. What is it? Yeah, I mean, I... I would go with press. It's a, just a pressing style. It's a uh, it's a team that or it's a way that we try to dictate it. Um, you know, you hear man marking a lot. I mean, it's not necessarily man marking, but it's if you get to that person next to you. You know, you if you see someone in there, that's who you step to. You know, you're not trying to s stay in the area, stay in a position. Go press them. If you see, you know, the left back has the ball and this guy, he could pass to him, go step to him. And we like to have one sweeper and the, the two center backs kind of switch off and, uh, you know, we'll try to keep an extra man back there. And so it's uh, getting them in a certain area. And there's a lot of trigger points where they start the press and uh, certain, certain passes, certain areas of the field uh, kind of dictate what we do and when we go. Can you talk about the form of Vaco and yeah. mm -hmm. how he's kind of just become now one of the most dynamic players in the league? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think he is. And, and again, I think Matias uh, had a tough decision. You know, he, Vaco's always been talented, always can do some amazing ball, amazing things with the ball. Um, but this wasn't doing other things that could help the team, you know, in, um, in that sense. And so he had a, you know, we weren't in a great area, you know, great start of the season, but he benched him and would hold him out until he showed this. And it wasn't not just showing in the games, but you have to do it in practice as well. And that's what he preaches. He says there's practice players, there's gamers. And I understand and I'm all for you having these gamers, but you better show me in practice. Then you'll get your opportunity in the game. And uh, not an easy decision, but he stuck by it. And, um, you know, I, I know Vaco didn't like it and wasn't, but he could have quit, could have said, no, I'm, I'm just going to collect my paycheck, but he bought in. And uh, I think it's now it's shown like he, he's, he's fit. He can do amazing things. And especially with the style, he gets the ball a lot more 30 yards out rather than at midfield or in our defensive third. And that's a lot more dangerous for us because he does like to dribble and can do great things with it. Was there ever a moment like preseason or early in the season when you lose fourth straight where you're thinking, Man, I know we have Matias Almeida, but we didn't really change this roster. And this team finished, as you said, dead last. Like, maybe this isn't going to work. Maybe we should have changed more. Did you ever think that? Uh, I kind of wondered that. You know, I wondered who, you know, maybe we should have changed. Or, you know, should have. But at the same time, there still was a belief in the locker room. And we still... You know, it's very cliche to say it at preseason. Everyone believes that they can do it. But it was still amazing situation you know we lose our fourth straight game at home against LAFC 5-0 just absolutely could have been worse to be honest it was absolutely horrible and he sat us down and he said I'm not changing our style I'm not changing how we're going to play the game if you guys don't like it I have no problem there's no ill will we will find a good place for you we could trade you and we're but I need every single person to buy in on this and kind of was a changing point. I mean, obviously, we kind of changed the lineup around a little bit, and that, was, that made uh, some difference as well. But at the same time, you know, we've used a lot of guys. We have a very deep team. I think we've had almost 24, 25 different guys play, like 20, 21 different starters. Uh, or have started at least one game, and uh, it's pretty cool to see. You mentioned all the change in lineup a little. Jackson Yule was a big oh. piece of that. Give the U.S. national team fans some hope here. What, yes, what's he like? no, yeah, give him a chance. Um, great guy, um, you know, and I think that he has un untapped potential. It's uh, sky's the limit for him. He was always very, um, you know, very tidy with the ball, very sees the game in a, in a great way and uh, able to connect the passes. I think his tackling and, you know, his ground coverage was his one bugaboo. But this year he's absolutely he's everywhere. If you look at the stats, I mean, he covers more ground. He's winning a lot of his duels. I mean, he's uh, he's, he's 
he's fit in really well and has kind of grown into just a special player, and I think he will continue to grow. Tommy Thompson's now a starter. He's also my favorite for the mayor of San Jose <laughs> in like 20 years maybe yeah. after that stump speech. Yeah. No, exactly. Well, that was directly after Mateus Almeida said, I'm not changing. No, exactly. That, that's exactly what it was. And uh, I love seeing TD with a little bit of, uh, <laughs> you know, some character charisma. You know, it's, uh, it was good to see. And he is. He's, uh, he's a good player, and it's it's fun to see him, you know, have confidence. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, again, confidence is a funny thing. It just kind of snowballs. And uh, you see it. You just see him having joy out there. Before we let you go, I have a question. Yeah. TSL made his biggest bone-crunching tackle in practice so far this year. Oh, we see. So, like, he, like, we'll, we do a lot of stuff where it's, like, offense, or, like, Wednesdays, the offense goes and uh, does it. And then defense, we, we bring a lot of the academy guys, and they kind of build up. And it's, like, 6v4. But, like, the, so the defense wins it. They try to do a small goal. I saw him just absolutely crush this one kid. Like, he <laughs> came in. An academy no, kid? No, it was, it was, I, <laughs> I think it was, uh, it might have been Jutsen. It could have been uh, Eric Cavillo. But, like, he had it and didn't see him. And so, like, he doesn't normally play. He's just knocking out the balls. But, like, he just comes and slides and was giving it all. I was just like, I, I was there over there finishing. And I happened to look over there. Just like, oh, wow. I'm glad on this side. <laughs> you, can see, you can see long hair exactly. billowing line. And then somebody <laughs> going down with a crush. Yeah. Mateo Sameda, Profe, we've loved watching him. Love watching the resurgence for the Quakes as well, Wando. Thank good you. luck with everything going forward, all right? I uh, appreciate you guys. Best Thank you. Life. Thanks, guys. All right, back <laughs> from Wando God, explaining over here. how he's, he's going to run through brick walls for Mateo Are we Almeida. Just call Charlie Button from now on. <laughs> Do we just call him Button? <laughs> yeah, Button. Mm, Charlie just got himself or, a nickname. Just, <laughs> why would you call him Benji? Benji. Yeah, I, like Button. Be, I think Button yeah. is a better nickname Button for Charlie. Davies. No doubt about that one. All right, we got some Sporting Kansas City mail here in the mailbag. We have somebody saying that, uh, well, he's saying, assuming Weeby doesn't screen these 100% of the time, I almost never do. That's David Goss. I got so you've four emails the other day that was all about you in a negative way, mm, and wow. I'm pretty sure we're all Did written you delete by them? you. No, I'm sure you write them yourself. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, yeah, you're like, I how could I get I stuff just, about me I wouldn't on the show. send it to the email. I would literally just put it in the rundown with a fake name well, and would, pretend like I found it. I would it. delete it because it wouldn't be from the mm, real mailbag, gotcha. obviously. Uh, there's some Sporting KC fans wondering if I'm a frequent poster on Reddit. Argumentative Andy is the screen name. That is not me. I don't mm. actually post on Reddit. I just lurk on whatever you guys are doing. Uh, we also have Adam from KC that says this season has been disappointing. A fall from the top of the Western Conference a year ago. What, if anything, is there to provide me and all the other Sporting Kansas City hope, uh, supporters just a tiny shred of hope? Should I give up and just focus on next year? You are the wise experts, yes. he says. Yes. yes. Throw in the towel. <laughs> Throw it in. Throw in the towel. This team... It is a shell of itself. Uh, Button's out here digging graves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was the one holding on hope for this Sporting Kansas City team. I was like, they are, they have so much experience. They have uh, some talented players, but throw that all out there. Yeah, the man, this it's roster done. is looking like the beginning Hopeless. of Benjamin Button's life. Just yeah. shriveled, just, yeah. just Hopeless. unable to keep up. Yeah, it's not, I mean, they, they made, it, in retrospect, Peter Vermees made a terrible bet on, uh, Andro Fantas over over Ico Parra. Um, but you have to want it, like they would be a significantly better team if they had kept Ike. And then the other thing is like Christian Nemeth and Eric Hurtado as your center forwards. But and it, it didn't work out. What's the hope for next year? Is there? What's, I what's think the there needs to be a, a spend. A, yeah, well, maybe, spend, maybe spend then we'll trim and spend. Yeah, and it's got to be you know, Johan Quaze has been a. a Barely a squad player. He's a DP. You gotta, you gotta do better with what you spend. You know, Daniel Shalloway looked like he was taking a big step forward last year. He's taking a bigger step backward this year. So there has to be inter yeah, like walk. internal progress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie Amazing. Just shredded people today. There I like this because be... it's taking the attention off me, just, <laughs> just being destroyed early on in the show. But they're like, what defined <laughs> Kansas City at the start of this? Past, uh, this decade was uh, getting improvement from guys like Beasler, Espinosa, Zussi. Fail Haber became a better player when he went yeah. there. <laughs> they haven't had that with this new generation. Peter Vermees has to find that. Grim zussi has been there a long time. He's seen it when it wasn't very good in the KC Wizards days and through all those great years as well. We talked to him about what it means to be a lifer at Kansas City. 
Graham Zutz, he's sitting down with us here in the Digital HQ, presented by Wells Fargo. Graham, I'm welcome. Yeah. Sorry. What's up, man? No, no. <laughs> you, you thought it was only yeah, on. yeah, you, <laughs> like you face wherever, wherever you want to face. That's why we thought you wore the glasses, <laughs> no, just for no showing idea. off. Camera <laughs> discipline here. Yeah. Jeez. Before we get into this, I want to talk to you about Sporting Kansas City and being like a lifer at a club, but I really want to know if Brad Evans stole your plans for post-career. It feels like he might have. He's living out of an Airstream, going around to national parks, and I truly believe that that was going to be your fate. Yeah, I feel like we may have talked about this before. But um, no, he's, he's, he's kind of got an early jump on me, <laughs> and I am I'm happy about it because I think I'll, I'll have a lot of good recs about the do's and don'ts of, yeah. of van life. Let him if fail. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you make the improvements. <laughs> That's right. Brad just had a, like a, just a sip in Kansas City. You have been there since, I mean, 09. I covered you being yeah. drafted yeah. in the second round, the first couple of years, waiting for an opportunity. Take me all the way back to 2009 to being drafted to coming into the then Wizards organization. It was a much, much different time for soccer in Kansas City. So I was uh, still at Maryland at the time, and I was actually in class when I got drafted. And I think I got a text from a buddy saying who I went to. Um, I think I may have left the class. I'm not going like, to lie. Class <laughs> I think after that, I think I left the class. Did you announce it? Were you like, guys, I just got drafted. I'm leaving? Or no, is one of them just like, I, if I just walk soccer out. Player, yeah. you know, Can't be bothered. I'm out. Put the backpack on. Right. Leave, leave the laptop. No, I, um, yeah, it was an uh, exciting time. At the time, Abe Thompson was in Kansas City. Called him shortly afterwards just to kind of get a little rundown because, I, I mean, I knew absolutely nothing about Kansas City, as I think most people don't going into that situation but um man how it's changed uh since i've been there from community america ballpark uh, with the wizards to to now Ch children's mercy park um maybe my biased opinion but but best uh, best stadium in the league was there an underrated aspect to cab was there anything that you actually <laughs> liked i remember interviewing no. peter by the urinals to be fair the pitch was immaculate Small, it may have been extremely small, but the pitch was perfect. And that, that I feel like that's one thing you always like. The yeah. first thing that comes to mind when, as a college player going to professionals, yes. you're like, let's check the pitch. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah. You're used to playing on hills in some places. Did you also call some of your former teammates that were already in the league and just asking about, you know, the demands the day to day? Yeah, I remember. I remember specifically. Um, Jason Gary was a, was a big kind of mentor um, throughout college, or I guess for a year of college and then um, post uh, post college as well. So uh, anytime I got a chance to talk to talk to Jay was um, a huge learning experience for me. Um, I think he'd probably be the the, the one guy that, that I really stick out and remember. 20, let's say 2020 Super Draft, the Terrapin calls you that gets drafted. What's your first message to them? Oh man, I you know. In my eyes, uh, Sasha does such a, a great job at um, preparing you for uh, the professional atmosphere, and um, you know, he creates that that atmosphere, and, and uh, he, he demands the excellence. He, he you know, the, the work ethic is is something I I, I really um, kind of grew up with at, at Maryland, so I think that translated so well. So. Um, you know, for me, it, getting drafted, uh, I, I think you saw the, the importance of it for me. I was in class, so I, that, part, that part of it wasn't what it was all about. You know, it was, it, th at that point, it's just a tryout. Uh, it's a glorified tryout. So, um, so I, guess, I guess just passing along that message, uh, you know, doing what... What got you, what made you successful at Maryland is what's going to continue to make you successful in the pros as well. I remember playing against you and the talented team that you had, so much depth. Is there a player that you played with at Maryland that was, you thought was extremely talented, was destined for greatness, but just didn't pan out as a professional? Stephen King. Um, the guy was, uh, he was brilliant on and off the field, uh, had probably the best engine of any soccer player I've ever played against. And, and don't get me wrong, he, he made it to the pros and had uh, a few years um, under his belt, but uh, I, I could have seen him being, being the guy. Uh, and it was, it's just bizarre that it didn't happen. No, it's funny because yeah. ODP, 
I started out with Stephen King, and yeah. he was that kid that could juggle for hours. Yep. We had juggling competitions, and he'd be left foot, right foot for hours, and I'm sitting there like, I can get 100 maybe. Yep. <laughs> And he's still going, like he was that talented I remember. always. He would, he would, so we'd have a training session, or even in the summer it'd be one of those brutal, wake up in the morning, do fitness, then have a, a session on the field. And then you'd see him just kind of trotting off the field. Kinger, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going for a 12 mile run now. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I just run to DC and back or something, something crazy <laughs> like that. But yeah, the guy was, the guy was, wow, man, he was, he was incredible. So you get to Kansas City, and you're right. It, it is a glorified trial, essentially. You yeah. make the team. But I, I still remember the first two years, stop, start. Is Graham going to earn that starting yeah. spot? What were those years like as you tried to kind of move your way in and figure out how to be an everyday starter, and a long-term sure. pro, really? Yeah, it, it, again, that aspect of it wasn't anything foreign to me. Um, you know, I played PDL with, with the Crays, and... Um, my early early days with them would be a, a substitute at the end of the game. Um, Maryland started, I think, one or two games my first my freshman year, um, and, and so it's for me it's always been uh, working my way up to earn that spot. Um, in the professional level was was really no different for me. So um, I guess all my all my years before MLS uh, preparing for that. You get into the team, and then you go from the Kansas City winners to supporting KC. Did it mean yeah. anything to you guys on the team? Like, did it change anything? Did it matter? Not really. That part didn't matter. Um, you know, I know it, it, it kind of pissed off a lot of people in Kansas City. Um, but but that part of me, the, the stadium was was everything for me. You know, the, having something of our own, um, uh, you know, a, a true fan base that that got behind us after after uh, they built that and um, for me that's when it all kind of kind of turned around. Yeah, I remember the goals. Bobby Warshaw does too. <laughs> the one from like half field that Davy Arno I think yeah, goaded yeah, you yeah. into hitting the yeah. one against Portland that's sort of iconic with the John Strong call. Right. There was, seemed like a time where it just kind of clicked for you, where everything started working out. I don't know if it was just that it started clicking on the field in games and you were doing it in training the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. Did you feel a moment where it's kind of like, oh, wow, I'm, I feel different. I'm performing differently. Things are working. Well, I think, I think it's easiest to look at those, those few games. Um, it's funny. So the, the season our stadium opened, we did that 10-game road strip. Somewhere in there. Something okay. like that. 10 game road, uh, road trip. Um, I think we had one win out of the 10 games. Came home. I wasn't supposed to start that first home game. Uh, Ryan Smith got injured in warm ups, and I ended up starting. And um, the energy from that game just kind of boosted me through. And I, and I, I had a strong game, but the next game was that Dallas game. Uh, and that's, that's when I think I scored two goals. Um, next game was the Portland game. Had two more goals, I believe. And y you know what confidence can do in this in this sport. It's it's everything. Um, that kind of pushed me through the rest of the season and um, got a little bit, little taste of it. And then off season is when I put in probably the the most work I I put in in my life. <laughs> so. It was, it was getting that little taste of success and on-field success and, and being in that starting lineup um, that made me never want to look back. So. so when you go through the whole process of building yourself up, yeah. now you're, you're hitting the ground running, you're high. Mm -hmm. When's the next time that you felt a big drop, like not rock bottom, but a, sure. a big piece of adversity in your <sighs> career? Honestly, it, it, it'd probably be this year uh, to, to be completely honest um, we had uh, we had a, a fantastic year last year um, we won the West um, which is a, a big accomplishment in itself deep deep uh, deep push into the playoffs um, Champions League early in the year I mean you could look at the Champions League at being a successful run as well um, the way we went out was a little bitter but um, 
yeah, for for whatever reason, we we kind of hit this hit this lull in our season, and um, typically our Kansas City teams have been very good at uh, scratching and clawing our way out of it, and um, for whatever reason, this one's just lasted longer than uh, than we would have liked. So um, this has been a a frustrating year um, for myself and and for the team. So, um, but. It's not over. So I, I would have thought you would have we, said uh, switching to right back. <laughs> <laughs> no, that rejuvenated my career, man. Okay, okay. I, I feel good about that. That was a that was a fun move, especially with with Kansas City the way we play. It's uh, it's been a lot of fun. So, um, but no, I mean, look, the the season's season's not at, uh, over in our eyes. Um, we all know what teams can go on runs, and and a lot of times the team that's that's hot in the end of the year. Does well, does well in the playoffs, so um, that's got to be our motivation. All right, Grim, we'll look for you in, I don't know, five years in an Airstream somewhere? Five years. Easy, man. Let's make it seven. Seven? <laughs> okay. All right, seven years. I like that. I was I was thinking somewhere in between. <laughs> seven more years for Grim Zussi. Thanks for stopping by. Cool. Yeah, Thanks, appreciate guys. it, man. Yeah, thank you. Now that we're on YouTube, Charlie, I think uh, you're definitely going to have to moonwalk your me? way out of this at the very end of the show. <laughs> we'll we'll save something? it for that. we got a little bit more mail coming for you right now. Uh, a question from Andrew in Brooklyn that I swear to God is not me. It is not me. We I didn't not, do yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Game working and you're now putting together the mailbag. This was in, this was in Monday's mailbag. Really this Brooklyn. was in Monday's mailbag, For which sure. you put together. Did you see it in Monday's mailbag? I did. I did. I'll go in Monday's mailbag. Well, oh, well no. Right, so if it's it, your word against mine. Guys, man, if it's about KU basketball, then we'll know. It's not. It's a question for Bobby or Charlie it's or Kaylin. Oh, guess who was at the game today? Paul Pierce? No. I hate you. Oh. Drew Gooden. Oh. What? Are you Where's real? Are excited? you actually? No, I have a picture. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I never took a selfie actually, with him. Yeah, yeah, I, I wish you, you, should, you should have told me because I definitely would have taken totally a selfie with him. I totally forgot that you went to Kansas. Oh wow! I just I have a baby too. Did you know that? Uh, this one's for you, Charlie. Do players know when a game is nationally televised, and does it change the intensity or focus brought to the game? So we talked about this earlier. With with Atlanta, would that matter to players? Would they think about that? Would that actually increase pressure or? Oh, players know when it's on national television. You show up, you know the bright lights are on. Cameramen are coming in the locker room. They're, they're eyeing you and putting on your, your, your cleats. And everyone's, you know, making jokes and cracking banter. And, you know, everyone's, everyone wants to talk about this game after. You want to have the highlights. You want to be on ESPN. You know, those are the games that everybody's watching, especially the small market team. So if you want to make a name for yourself, you show up in those so games. So I have a question. National TV game. That was good. National TV game. <laughs> Do you guys all pitch in and bring a barber into the locker room to get cut? Or does see, everyone have their own now, schedule? See, now he's getting it. Yeah. National TV games, you, you best clean. believe the night before, everyone's in the barber shop. <laughs> everyone. Maybe the night, the, the day of, morning of, <laughs> barber shop, clean shave, ready to go. You talking about putting your cleats on? You always see those shots in the locker room. Mm -hmm. How, oh, how, how set yeah. up are those? Do you know they're coming? Are they like, Charlie? We're gonna get you. We need you to like keep your cleats off. You, you're gonna get you. Yeah, you have a feeling it's coming because you see the guy posted up and he's kind of like just hawk eyeing you. Yeah. And everyone knows like, okay, he's been on a hot run. They're definitely coming in to film you. And as soon as it, it gets going. That's when the comments come flying from left and right and center, <laughs> from every locker. Guys are like, hey, look at, look at, look at, look at, he's nervous. You know, it, 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 oh, it's, it's always funny. You're trying to keep a straight face, like putting on your. Yeah, try not but to screw up the loop. I could never keep a straight I, face. I only do bunny ears. I've never actually learned how to tie my shoes in an adult way. Loop and so I would, I would definitely be the person that was like, don't put me down there. I don't want the, na <laughs> the nation to see that I don't actually know how to tie my shoes. Last one before we get out of here. Uh, this one's from Jed says, what's the benefit of having two transfer windows as opposed to one transfer deadline like other sports? It's just the way FIFA works. They're, they're, I mean, I don't have a, a good answer for this other than... You can address the roster yeah, issues. Yeah, mid-season. Mid-season. If you have a, a crazy... A player has a crazy injury and, and he's not going to recover. If it's a long term, maybe it's a career ending. And he's a star player. You have the, the ability to go out and... and and address that position. I think it's it's needed in, in a lot of cases for uh, maybe there's a player with a bad attitude or something that you need to ship players. I think it's great that there's two windows. And the middle window is obviously not a longer one. It's the summer, the off season windows that are, are typically longer. If you were an MLS executive, would you go big in the winter window because it's preseason? 
or summer because you're probably getting someone for cheaper? I'm going winter because I want my player to have a full preseason and, and get, a, get to know his teammates so you can, you know, you get all those kinks out before the season starts. All right. That's it for us here today. Uh, this weekend, week 22, a bunch of good stuff. Dave, Lori, Lindsay, and I will wrap it up on Match Day Central on Sunday. Five really, really good games among many Wait, are you important hosting games. that? Or is, is Gasman? I don't know. That's a good it. question. Lori has a oh, yes. good point. She's good doing point. all midfielders, so she's going to host uh -huh. it. Right. And now so you're, you're, you're not, you're, she's going to go to box. the board? I'm serving hummus in okay. the green room, yeah, yeah. and I think Weeby's just cleaning shoes. That's yeah, like, yeah, right. Just I'm just practicing tying my shoes yeah, in the yeah, back yeah. room. Just gonna, just gonna have me practice tying We're shoes. We're worried about Cam Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern on Fox. <laughs> Atlanta, and the LA Galaxy, 7:30 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. You have New England, LAFC, Bruce and Bob on ESPN Plus. That's and the big one. A triple header on Sunday. 4 p.m. on ESPN, Minnesota, Portland, 7.30 on FS1, DC, Philly, 10 on FS1, Seattle and Sporting, Kansas City. We're getting out of here. For the last time, my partner's in soccer. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See ya. <laughs>